Hey, it's Sika. Everyone who stays said, Well, as a man of God, he comes and he anoints and appoints you to be the first king. And he says, This is what God wants you to do. You're the king now and do these things. How many of y'all would be very serious about performing the request that you were given? There's never been a you, you have been privileged to be the first king in Israel's history. And 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 and, and in this is a great opportunity, but he There is never a bigger opportunity than doing the will of God. There is never a bigger opportunity than doing the will of God. Never. I don't care how much money is on one side of the and how much and what's on the other side of the There is never, if there's $20 billion on that side of the cliff and the will of God on that side of the cliff, that's the bigger opportunity. It's always regarded. You don't know how many breaths you can create that day that $20 billion. God gives you every one of them. I promise you, if you don't have air for five minutes, well, five minutes. if you don't have air for 40 seconds, you will realize real quick that $20 billion is not as important as the things that God supplies you with every single day. Your heart beats. How many of y'all think about how many your heart beats? How many of y'all focus real hard and make sure your heart beats? How many of y'all wake up early in the morning and work real hard so that your heart beats? No. God causes your heart to beat on rhythm, on time, every time until your last day. He provides blood breath in your lungs. He gives you everything. There is nothing more important. There is no level of promotion greater than the will of God in your life. There's nothing. Nothing more important. You want, sometimes we don't realize until we have 20 million in our hand. We have 20 million in our hand, we realize we need to also so much greater. We don't realize it until it's too late. We know the rich man Lazarus. Lazarus is outside his house. He keeps just living his life, you know, partying every night. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he wakes up one day and sees a hot place. And, and he, he starts going and wait my, my brothers, they need to know about this. They need to, they need to figure out about this. He, his priorities get in order real quick. Once he realizes that those things that he had were the most important thing in life, his priority starts reading. And he starts saying, well, wait a minute, let me go back and tell my brothers. Have let this come in. He give me a little like, He starts realizing that, these, that, these, that these gods, that it is serving God and, and doing the will of God is actually profoundly more important. Way more important. Than anything this world has to So I'm going to read verse 9 again. The heavenly music over verse 10 says, But Saul and the people spared Adad and the best, everybody say best, yes. of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs. And all that was good and was not only to destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, they destroyed utterly. I want you to think about this. This is a lot like the way we do things with God. This is a lot like the way I do things with God, where I give God the parts of my life that are broken, the parts of my life that are hurting, the parts of my life that I'm fed up with. I give God things. That, that I don't really, you know, I don't know how to work out. But this thing over here just making my life feel good and it's really cool and I like it a lot. I try to keep that to myself. I don't let God worry about this stuff over here. But this over here is mine. You know, I, I see a lot, like when I see this attitude, I see a lot of myself in it. I mean, I, I've been here before where, I, where I've given God things. In the, when I'm in the dating world, you know, I really, I, I cuss it. I stopped. I mean, in high school, I got saved when I was about 17 ish, right there in that 17 phase. And, and, I, and I, I gave God everything. I started preaching to people, but I still dated the baddest kids I mean. Like, I didn't care about anything. Like, like I still, you know, certain steroids, but still over here. I still take myself. Like, I was like, 
probably like a problem right there, just you know, on the side note that stuff, but you know, if somebody's always bragging about this and that about their quality, what they're doing, there are probably some insecurity there. But it's interesting to me that, that he is so uh boisterous about what he feels he has done for God. What he feels he's done for God. He, he feels like he has done something great for God. I formed it the man of the Lord. Why? Because he Emma, who God gave him the power, by the way, to overthrow Emma about God, right? He gave him power to do that. And he's done it. And he feels like he's completed the command of the Lord. But I don't, but what do y'all think? Y'all think he completed the command of the Lord? We all know. But uh, obviously, you know, but this, and this is the thing with God, you know, this is what I say, He just looks at things different. And this is a problem with Pharisees, you know, anybody who, who thinks that they're holy or perfect or whatever inside of the Lord just doesn't get how holy God is. Like, and nobody gets how holy God is because I don't think we get in our lives, but if we even come to any time when I say how holy God is, we are left with ourselves and our mirror and red in the recognition that we are far from where we should be. And that doesn't disprove anybody. Uh, that includes Pastor John. That includes Pastor Darrell. That includes Pastor Bobby. That includes Bishop so and so and Elder so and so and whoever you think is close to God and anybody else in the world. When you recognize how holy God is, you start to realize that we fall short, that we are far. We need a savior. <laughs> we need a savior. All right, so. The same is saying, what meaning then does bleeding of the sheep in my ears? And the lowing of the oxen with my ears. And so, so, so I just want to say this. So, so he's sitting there praising himself and Sam's in here back. You know, he's praying himself and he's here, whatever sound oxen they can make, they can So, so he's hearing stuff in the background. He he got your singly legs up. He figured, he had not figured out he already got your up. But yeah, you're saying for command this command. So he's saying, well, why am I hearing that? Why am I hearing that? There's evidence contrary to the things you're saying to me right now. All right, go ahead, then. And it's all said they have brought them from the animal. For the people spare the best of the sheep and of the oxen, the sacrifice of the Lord by God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto them, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of uh, the sinners of Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the, the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone away which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of the uh, king of Amalek, and utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. All right, so over. The sacrifice of the Lord thy God. So he, he, he makes several excuses. One says, well, wait a minute, Sam. We're going to think that this really good stuff is a sacrifice to the Lord. This is for God. The reason I'm doing this thing that's selfish against his will is 
Just kind of oh just totally overlooks. But uh but what do you think if, if how many uh because most of the stars are all open? So those of us that are all open, what do you think that Samuel, how do you think Samuel's gonna deal with this next day? Do you have any, any thoughts in mind what Samuel's gonna do next? Now bear in mind, AK is somewhere trapped, right? They, they just all right, keep going, And Samuel said, Have the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings. Have the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Say it again. Say Have the Lord as great delight in the burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Say it again. Say it again. I will tell you. Pay, pay a bunch of money and God's going to be pleased. So, this, this is clear. What, what argument is Samuel trying to say? He's trying to say, what well, takes priority, sacrifices or obedience? In this particular context, what he's saying right now, what he's saying? He's saying, what? Obedience. He's saying, if the Lord takes more delight in sacrifices than on people obedience, thank you. So you're going to go, you're going to disobey God's sacrifice. Which who knows that would be not in his mind. Maybe he gave us a sacrifice of the Lord. You know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Okay, so then I go to the next message here. Is that, you know, he already blamed the people for wanting to get the sacrifices. Now he's saying, I feared the people. That's why I made this decision. Now, if you think there might be there was some measure. I mean, he gave all this for the people, you know, there could be something, right? I think there might be some truth there. But one way or another, whether there's truth in that and his excuse or not, I don't think God is in good excuse at this point. Go ahead. Now, therefore, I pray to you, pardon my sin and turn again with and turn again uh, with me that I may worship the Lord. And Saul said unto Saul, Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned about to go away, and he laid a, a hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath the right the kingdom of Israel to be with them, and hath given it to a neighbor of thou that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of the people, of my people, and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then said Samuel, bring uh, 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 So, uh, sorry. So, see, when I look at this story, I, I think to myself, was Saul ever really repent in his heart? Because when I look at how he deals with this, there's still that in background. While he's talking to Samuel, Samuel's hearing animals in the background that are still alive and well. The king is still locked up. And 
Saul still has the word of the Lord that told him to destroy these things. But he says, you know, here, it's no credit to the word of the Lord. How many of y'all know God might have told you to do God might have something still on your shelf that you're supposed to do for him. You, you, you refocus on other things, you still have something right here that you're supposed to do. Like, to me, if I had been Saul, when Samuel came up to me like that and, and, and told me that stuff, I'm like, I'm not going to go. I'm taking that sword, I'm going to slap it. So we can worship later. We can worship later. We can, we, we, we can do whatever later. First of all, I'm getting done what God sent me to do. <laughs> then we can do whatever else, right? But you don't see that as a complicated song. And I'm not saying that there wasn't any more rebellion. I don't know that he had already crossed the line. He was uncrossable. You know, he already, uh, I mean, for, the, for what God I can trust him with, he already went too far. But, uh, but you know, I just don't see, to, to me, he did not handle this. I, I want to tell you that if God told you to do something, go and freaking do it. Go and do it. Go and do what God told you to do. Go and do what God told you to do. If he told you to do something, go and do it. I don't care if it's your car. I don't care if it, 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 it gets you way outside of my understanding. Whatever. It doesn't matter. God told you to do Go and do it. I'm sorry, but, but that team would have cut the edge of my blade <laughs> before that conversation was over. How about hold on right there? Before you say anything else, you can see the medicine I would go, I would go, I did tell my shit. I would instruct this guy, hey, I have to tell him what's up. I'm mean, out to make the time outside. You know, I'm thinking this would be it for my breaches. Go ahead and deal with this, right? But in this case, I love how Sam will answer the answer. So go ahead and uh, hand it to verse 32. Then said Samuel to them, Then a bridge of the victory of the king and the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came and went to kill John to kill the city. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of that is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless and my women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord and in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah. And Saul. That's the man of God. I told you. That's the man of God. The, the word of God is given to us. God wants to get done. He didn't tell me to do it. He told him to do it. But he didn't do his job. I'm going to go ahead and finish the job. I'm going to go ahead and do it. I mean, some of y'all were raised by men like that. Some of y'all were raised. There are people in this world that were raised by men like that. God gave another person a responsibility. But somebody else stepped up and handled their responsibility. You know, God will raise somebody else up. He don't need you to praise or watch the cry out. He don't need you to, you know, God will always raise somebody else up to do what you're called to do. The honor, the blessing is in you doing what God called you to do. He don't need you. He wants you. He wants you. He wants you to be here. He wants you to love. He wants you to put him over everything else. He wants you to serve. He wants you. He don't need you. He can raise up anybody. That's why we can't get caught up in the, what we think of ourselves and how great we are or low we are. Or y'all not supposed to talk about this stuff. I'm not pretty talk about that enough. It doesn't matter. Because God can use you. He can raise up anybody. He can do anything he wants to. He can use a donkey. He don't need anything. He's God. He wants you to be involved. He wants you to be the person he called you. In verse 35, it says that Samuel came no more to Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king of Israel. So Samuel uh, never ever visited Saul again. Now think about that. Did Saul stop being 
on paper the city that day. In Israel. Did he stop being on paper? Don't you? We know that Saul was king for long after. Right? But on paper, Saul stayed king. But in the most important place in the universe, in the mind of God, as far as God was concerned, that day, Saul was no longer the king of Israel. That day, God removed him. His, he was granted his natural presence, and he was positioned in David from that day forward. And I mean, I know Saul could see it happen in slow motion right before his eyes. This young dude coming to slay the kings, women saying that he slayed 10,000, Saul slayed thousands, all these things out of the blessing of God going before this young man who did nothing but love and adore King Saul and did everything right beside the Lord at that moment. This was all that. Brave warriors, mighty warriors. Um, God, had, God can raise something. This is not the spirit, but God can raise somebody up to do what you're called to do. I don't ever want to get so beside myself and think that somehow I'm holding this thing together, that somehow, you know, if, if, if I were to die, you know, sometimes as, as a father, you get this, you start thinking about what happens if I die and leave my family behind. Especially you know, if you do. But, but I mean, I think every father thinks that, I every mother thinks that at some point. But every father, I can speak to mothers, every father thinks to himself, what happens if I die? What if, what if I die and my kids, you know, God forbid, crazily blame God? Or my kids somehow depart from God and, and because I have that deposit of in Or, or they don't have enough to provide, or, or whatever. We have a thousand little things in our mind about what happens uh, when we die. Um, I want you to know that if you die, God will still be in control. He'll be in control just as much the day that you die as he was the day before you died, the day before that, the day before that, and the day after that, he will still be in control because he don't need us. And to make it feel more personal, he don't need you. He don't need you. That's the beautiful thing about serving God. We serve a God who represents ultimate comfort. He's able to complete everything. He's able to restore everything. He's able to hold everything together. He's able to bring it to pass. He's able to bring his word to The word he's going to your child, he's going to meet you there. Water that seed. That word is going to go. I mean, he probably wants you there at water that seed as long as, you know, he wants you there. I, I think that I think that Samuel wanted Saul to do the right thing. God wanted Saul to do the right thing. Obviously, the God that sees him from the beginning, Duke Saul was going to depart from, from his will. But, but, but he wants those things for us. But that is not, you know, God doesn't have to. Uh, he doesn't have to have those things. You know, he, he, can, he can absolutely uh, raise anybody up. He can cause anything to be restored. He can speak the word and it takes place. He doesn't need our help. Samuel had the luxury of serving God. He had the luxury of bringing God's uh, uh, wishes to pass that now. He had the luxury of those things. And we have we be something kind of with this mind. Uh, and then he has specific requests for our life. I want you to, you know, when God asks you to do what he asks you to do, find, make sure that you get all the details right about what he wants you to do. It's not good enough. If God asks you to start a soup kitchen and to feed homeless people, and, and you know, you start a soup kitchen, you cuss out everybody that comes there, and you treat everybody like garbage, you don't tell anybody about Jesus. But you meet homeless people. I'm sorry, I don't think you're fulfilling what God's called you to do. 
You just think you are. You're operating far of what God wants to do. You guess what? That's not all God has told you to do. He told you many things. Now there's a specific thing he told you to do, but how to do it is kind of crazy. You know, when God asks you to do something, it's not good enough to be there. It's not just good enough to be present and kind of do what God wants you to do. We want to operate with perfection. We want every little detail of what God desires. And that focus, that focus is what God, you know, that focus is based on our, our faith and obedience towards God. That's what it's based on. And that's what God uses to bless us. He you know that God gets to the store. He uses that faith, that obedience, that attitude towards Him, that adoration. He uses that. Uh, to, to do great things and to substitute things and cause great things to happen. And we just feel like we're a part of something that God is going to do. But we need to allow us to be along for pride, to allow us to be part of it. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to slay, to slay a threat, a giant, or to do certain things. But I see what, it, what it's like to pray, to lay hands, and healing takes place. I see what it's like to, to, to do the, the, the things that God's called you to do, prophesy. And the prophecy comes with bad scripture, or it's speaking I know tongue, or it's being given that. I, I've seen I've seen those things. There are other things that I love to see, but I've seen enough. I thank you for, for God for what he's done. But our approach towards what God says, what God commands, what God desires has to be that of perfection. God doesn't want things happening now. He doesn't want a 90% on the court bar. If God calls you to do it, he calls you to be 100% He calls you to be 100% does anybody have any comments? Anybody have any comments about the story? No, I'm sorry, I thought she had some sorry. Julian. So the bird is the first man. It's a time where it says God is very based off. I mean, based off of me. And then I have to look at, you know, based the same thing I would think of God is not there. You should be there. But then uh, earlier it said that, you know, God is very based off. Of so what is it? it it's, it's, it's just it's just the context of where it's been. Uh obviously God is upset that he made us all I mean, uh we know that God who sees the hand from the beginning do what Saul is right? But it doesn't mean he's got to be upset because the same sense of God uh I mean that context. Uh the same sense God God oftentimes I mean God knows everything we have to do, it doesn't mean he's to do it. A lot of people have the problem with uh, just all on these same lines. That's what I want to understand. A lot of people have the problem of thinking that God, if God creates a person that's going to go to hell, he's forcing them to go to hell. They, they, they have that in their mind because they can't, connect, they can't connect the fact that God, just because God knows something, doesn't mean he causes that. You know, in there, and they still have free will to choose it to have a problem. You know, I know for a fact, if I drive uh, Abigail to Bronx, I know I am not that. I have a 90,000% chance that she's going to want birthday day ice cream. I, I think that I know that. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, it's almost as clear as, you know, a very clear things in my life. 99% she's going to want birthday day ice cream. Does that mean I'm causing her to get a birthday cake ice cream by, by taking her to Bronx? No. I just know, I just know she's going to do it. So, uh, so God, God in his corner knowledge sees the end from the beginning. He already, he already sees the end from the beginning. But it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't bother me how we don't make decisions. And, and, and I think it's important that the scripture shows us in real time God's feelings. Now, a lot of times we don't talk about God's feelings, but guess what? They're replete in scripture. We see God has feelings of truth. He, 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 he feels bad about that. You know, it bothers God to do certain things. It's important that we know God is a person. God can't, like, God has a heart and he cares about how we do that. That's what the book of Hosea is about. You know, God, God caring about us so much. You know, so God has a feeling like when you do stuff, when you do certain stuff, it bothers God. You know, when you go certain paths, it bothers God. It, 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 uh, you know, for lack of a better term, I hate it, but for lack of a better term, it, 
it, it deals with God's deal with the ball. God's deal with the ball, sir. And when you start with the Donald Rand, wow. you know, you see all these these statements that they have made dealing with God is expressing. And God has a right that because you know what I'm saying in real time. So uh, it does bother God when you choose certain paths. So uh, and like I said, we have to we have to look at scripture in the context of the full scope of who God is. And it's hard to do that because God is so bad. We got a better way to find that. All right. Then, kind of for now, we'll, we'll get into it more. Many people personally get into what we're saying. Any other questions, comments? Pastor John. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't, the Bible doesn't talk about it, but. There's, I would assume there were some people killed when they were attacking the Amaleks. And so you would have thought that if they lost your brother, your sister, something in war like that, that you would have wanted to kill the king and all these other animals just from a from a natural perspective of, of revenge. And to let them live and the other things live would, would have bothered you. And from and from a spiritual perspective, you know, it's I've always felt a spot in my heart for Saul. Like, uh, you know, did he do the, you know, did he, did he get a fair shake or, or should he got another chance? But you, you brought up a good point today that God looks at your heart. And so no matter what we think of what Saul did, God knew exactly what his thoughts and motivations were and was able to punish him accordingly. That's really right. We can even see that in the rest of Saul's life. We see God. We see Saul do this exact type of thing again later on, right before his dead. Uh, we see him obviously kick back against God. But but I want to say, what was that first statement you made again? The first statement you made. Well, that that there, it doesn't all often talks about it in the Bible. But whenever the Israelites went to war. I assume they lost some people. I don't know that 100% of the Israelites all live and none of their soldiers died or anything. And so you would have thought there had been some revenge if your brother or relative had got killed in that process. Yeah, yeah, but, th but there was a, um, you know, there was a value in preserving a king's life at times. Um, and that value, Saul wanted to utilize that value. And, um, oh, so, and oh, I mean, and, and also remember this, like we're we're dealing with the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now working in the children of disobedience. So oftentimes, like when you're dealing with the enemy, when the enemy's in control, like things that you would think would be like, for instance, why do Jehovah's Witnesses love to study the Bible so much? <laughs> like, why do why do Mormons love to like 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 some of these guys, they're the enemy is behind them doing what they're doing. So, so you know, in a natural sense, we think, oh, you would obviously want revenge, but Saul's being led by the enemy at this point, right? So he's he's more likely to, you know, God wants this, so he's likely to kick back and rebel against what God wants. So uh, we're dealing with spiritual warfare here, and Saul is a Saul is, is basically uh, a uh, not a victim, but he's being, you know. So, but anyway, that, that that's that's just me. You can talk about that on a personal note another time as well. That's one of those. Uh, but yeah. Um, uh, did you have anything else to add to that, sir? Anybody else have any other comments, questions, concerns, statements? Uh, Pastor Bobby. Our praise Pastor Lord Saint Darryl. Praise the Lord Saints. How we doing? Can you here? Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I thank God for this wonderful lesson today. I was making some notes, just really good stuff here. I thank God for Pastor John. Pastor Daryl is actually preaching in Miami today. Keep him lifted up. It's also his birthday. I think uh, the announcers will be covering more on that. But it's also his birthday today, so make sure you wish Pastor John happy, uh, Pastor Daryl a happy birthday. Um, and uh, I'm a little under the weather today. I don't have COVID, thank God. I've been tested, but it's just a cold. And uh, my wife reminded me, she said, now, when you, when you have, uh, when, when people have bad colds, you tell them not, not to come. You know, so you don't give me that. So you got to you got to do what you that you tell other people to do. So I thank God for my wife, um, and uh, she reminded me of what I, what I said. So I'm I'm here, and I enjoyed the word. 
uh, enjoyed this lesson by Pastor John. Thank him for being in place to uh, to give this word. Uh, I really was blessed by the whole lesson. There's so many pieces of it that was so good. I think I liked uh, the best part. I liked today was we talked about be, being a new believer and uh, the uh, his friend misunderstood the scriptures and thought he had to get rid of his gold and just dumped all his gold because he thought that's what the Lord wanted, even though the Lord didn't want that uh, necessarily. And how God would just look at the heart, the guy that was trying to do the right thing. You know, he, he was just misguided, but was trying, you know, and God is like that. You never as a parent punish your kids when they're trying to do the right thing and they just do the wrong thing. But if they were trying and their heart was right, you just don't do that. Uh, no good parent does that. You, you know, if they make a mess trying to do the right thing, you just, you just love them all that much more. You pick them up out of that mess and hug them and thank them for having the right thing in their heart. And I, and I, and I think it's so important we understand that God is a God who looks at the heart. And so even if we miss it sometimes, just make sure your heart's in the right place. Make sure you're doing everything from a standpoint of loving God and loving his children. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and if your motivation is, is loving God and loving his children and loving his creation and, and you mess up, you're going to be okay. And, and I like Pastor John. He said that God just won't break you off even when he's pleased. He'll bless you. So I just really enjoyed it and look forward to uh, the, uh, the next portion of the service. God bless you. Um, I pray that you help us to do your will, Father God. Uh, I thank you for calling us, Father God, a very chosen generation, Father God. I pray that we strive to do your will, Father God. I pray that we strive to teach you, Father God. Um, I pray that you forgive us of all iniquities, Father God. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that curses us, Father God. Um, I pray throughout our daily lives, God, that we are able to use us, Father God, and that we stay in a position of being able to be used by you, Father God. Um, I thank you for the day, Father God. I pray that you bless this service. God bless the people, Father God. Let your will be done in this place, Father God. In Jesus' name, Father God. I give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. In Jesus' name, I pray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.